This audio presentation was pre-recorded and edited for brevity and clarity. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Diane Bovenkamp, Vice President, Scientific Affairs at Bright Focus Foundation. I'm pleased to be here with you for today's macular degeneration chat. Can vision loss be reversed? Exploring stem cells and AMD. This chat is brought to you today by Bright Focus Foundation. Macular degeneration research is one of our programs here at Bright Focus. We fund exceptional scientific research worldwide to defeat Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. And we provide expert information on these heartbreaking diseases. Just sit back and relax and enjoy our wonderful scientific discussion. I know I'm excited and I'm totally pleased to introduce today's guest, Dr. Kapil Bardi who's the Senior Investigator and Director of Intramural Research uh, Program at the National Eye Institute of the National Institutes of Health. Some of you may have heard NIH. Dr. Barty's lab at the NEI recently started the first US Phase one uh, slash 2A trial to test autologous IPSC-derived RPE patch in AMD patients. And there's a lot of alphabet soup in there but by the end of this talk, you'll know what all of those uh, acronyms mean. Currently, he is co-developing a dual RPE photoreceptor cell therapy with uh, Opsis Therapeutics. He has given several keynote lectures and won several awards for his revolutionary work on developing ocular cell therapies. His current work as a senior investigator at NEI involves understanding the mechanism of retinal degenerative diseases using an induced pluripotent stem cell, that's the IPSC, derived eye cells and tissues, and developing cell-based and drug-based therapies for such diseases. Dr. Vardy, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Diane, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for, for having me here. And before we begin, I actually do want to applaud you and the Bright Focus Foundation for supporting really amazing basic and translation research in the macular degeneration field and for organizing events like that you're organizing today to educate the community on macular degeneration, its disease pathology, and the treatments that many of us are working on. It's, it's our absolute pleasure to do that, and uh, it's, it's just, you know, a wonderful to, to be a partner with you um, as we try and push forward to help all affected families. So thank you so much. Um, before we jump into our exciting conversation exploring stem cell research, um, I did want to mention <laughs> that the contents of this chat are intended for informational and educational purposes only and not for the purpose of rendering medical advice. Please consult your physician and personalized med uh, for personalized medical advice. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions regarding a medical condition and especially before beginning any new treatments or clinical trials. Sorry, I had to do that legal disclaimer, especially since you work for the government and we're also a nonprofit. So uh, in, in summary, uh, go to your doctor if you have any uh, questions. So anyways, um, so uh, I'm... I think that um, a lot of people are interested in, you know, they hear stem cell this and stem cell that. Um, can you just explain to us what, what is a stem cell? Um, so stem cell, the definition of a stem cell is very simple. It's a cell that can make more copies of itself under certain conditions. And under different conditions, it can make other cell types. And I think the most classical example I like to give is the cells, uh, bone marrow stem cells, the cells that make our blood. We all know that blood cells replenish every three months or so, and that's because we have blood stem cells in our bone marrow and in our spleen, and these cells keep making, keep replicating and keep maintaining themselves as, as blood stem cells, but when every three months they keep making new copies of blood cells for our body. And that, that's, a, that's a very um, focused stem cell or what you call a cell that has very limited potential. It cannot make any other cell type beyond uh, blood cells, but then stem cell like iPS cell that you mentioned earlier, induced pluripotent stem cell that can be made from any adult tissue, any adult cell, 
it has the potential to make any cell type of the body. That's why it's called pluripotent. If we, in a dish, we can keep this cell forever as a stem cell, or we can use it to make cells of the eyes, cells of the heart, cells of the lung, the liver, the brain, you name it. So that's a stem cell. Multipotent, if it's a blood stem cell, it can only make limited cell types. Pluripotent, if it's an IPS cell, it can make any cell type of the body. And these have, uh, have to do with, you know, what tissue they're in, what environment they're in, and all of the, you know, proteins and chemicals these stem cells are bathing in, right? It kind of uh, defines the identity it, it ultimately becomes. It, it depends uh, on what kind of stem cell it is, Diane. If it's a multipotent mm -hmm. stem cell, like the cell of that blood, uh, stem cell that makes the blood, that's of course is defined by the environment it is in, that is the bone marrow, that is the spleen, and it can only make blood stem cells. We all go to get haircuts. That's because we have stem cells in those hair shafts inside our, our skin that keep making <laughs> new hair protein, right? So that stem cell will only make hair cells, right? Uh, we have cells in our stem cells in our muscles. We all know that if we exercise, our muscles regenerate. They become bigger. They become stronger. And that's because we have stem cells in our muscles. But those stem cells will only make muscle stem muscles, whereas IPS yeah. cells are actually an artificial class of stem cells. They don't. They are not present in our body. We induce them in a dish from patients or from anybody's skin cells or blood cells. We we just need. A handful of cells, I, I, I even need half a cc of blood, even less than that, to make IPS cells from anyone we can in the lab. And these cells, uh, for practical purposes, are very identical to, or almost identical, I would say, to the embryonic stem cell, the famous, ill-famous stem cell that people have talked about for a while and have a mm -hmm. lot of political, political issues associated with them. Embryonic stem cells, are present in a blastocyst in an embryo. They make our entire body. We all uh, have mm -hmm. uh, seen that or heard about that. IPS cells are identical to embryonic stem cells in a, in a way that these cells can also make all the cells of the body, but they all, all the things that we do with them are happening in a dish. They're not present inside our body. Great. Um, so so that's, uh, that's a good point. You talked about, about hair. <laughs> And you talked about spleen and muscle. Um, would you explain a bit more about, you know, your specialty, which is what the retinal pigment epithelium or RPE cells, and how do these IPSC cells become R uh, RPE um, or other cell types to, to prepare for future, you know, for transplantation stem cell therapies? Yeah, no, good question, Nayan. So, RPE cell, uh, that's an acronym, retinal pigment epithelium, as you said. This is a cell type that is present behind the retina. We should think about it this way. People who have been here long enough know that we used to use polarized cameras, polarized cameras in the past, where we would have always a black screen in the back and a light-sensitive film in the front. And light-sensitive screen was what captured the light, and that's where the image was formed. Very similar to that, the eyes, like the retina is a light-sensitive part that perceives light and sends signal to the brain so we all can see, whereas the retinal pigment epithelium is a little bit of a dark screen in the back that protects uh, the light from hitting the uh, rest of our brain and also shows us direction of the light. So it's, it has that function, but it has many other functions. It nourishes the retina throughout its life. It helps protect the retina from injuries and from damage due to inflammation and things like that. So this tissue, the RPE, is very important tissue for us to be able to functionally see uh, on a everyday basis. So if RP cells don't function properly, our photoreceptors, which are the light-sensitive cells in the retina, they start to die. And of course, uh, with diseases like macular degeneration, that's what happens, and patients would, would go blind. Um, unlike the, the muscle or the blood or the hair, RP cells do not have any stem cells in them, or not widely mm. known stem cells that can keep regenerating new RP cells. So once an RP cell stops functioning properly and eventually can, uh, starts to die, well, there's no way to for the body to replace them. And that's the reason, Diane, that patients uh, go blind, because when RP cells die, as I said, the photoreceptors would die. So what surgeons tried for a long time was that when they saw that in macular degeneration patients, 
It's only south in the center of the eye, literally almost a five millimeter area, which is uh, five uh, five millimeter, which is like one fifth of an inch, is the area that dies off. But that area, the center part of the eye called the macula, hence the disease macular degeneration, that area mm -hmm. is the most important part for our vision. So what surgeons would do is that they said, okay, if the cells are RP cells are dead here in this area, what if we bring fresh and uh, fresh RP cells from the periphery of the same eye and put them in the center? Would this support the photoreceptors and perhaps protect the photoreceptors from dying and maybe stop the disease from progressing further? You can imagine it's a complicated surgery because you have to cut out one part of the eye, put it to the other part of the eye, but in 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 some number of cases where the surgeons were successful in doing that surgery correctly, they saw that the RP cells that were transplanted in this new area, they survived for years to come, and they supported the photoreceptors for years to come. So that, mm -hmm. for us, uh, provided the proof of concept that if we can make this RP cells from patients on stem cells, patients on IPS cells that we talked about a few minutes ago, in a dish, well characterize them and then bring them at the right place, which is the macula, at the right time of the, of the disease, we have a fighting chance of stopping this disease from progressing further. So that's the whole approach that we have taken from IPS now to making the RP cells in a dish. We use classical developmental biology that we have learned that Bright Focus has supported over the years, how RP cells have made from in, in an embryo, as, as an embryo forms, as the eye form, how do RP cells, uh, how do RP cells differentiate? And this, ha this work has been done in many different species, you know, mouse, rat, uh, chick, so many different areas where RP uh, development has been studied. We took all of that knowledge and we transferred that into making the best possible way, the fastest possible way of RP cells from IPS cells in a dish. And that protocol worked great. Uh, we can now, within 10 weeks, uh, make from patients on IPS cells a fully mature, pure culture of RP transplant that we can bring back to patients' eyes. That is just so amazing um, how, uh, you know, that's what science is. Scientists are, you know, really generous. They publish the work and then, you know, so what you're doing is you're, you, you, whatever work you're doing, you're building upon the shoulders of, of past giants, right? Um, so, you, you know, what you're doing today is a culmination of many years' work. And so can you explain, uh, I think that um, what, uh, maybe some listeners are saying, well, why do you need to just get cells from the same person? And I think it has to do with, say, like, a, you know, um, transplantation rejection, right? Um, am I right in that? Instead of just getting just a generic IPS cell, you want to get a cell from the same person so it'll stick? That is absolutely correct, Diane, because that example, that surgical example I gave you, there, these were patients on RP cells from the same eye even, right? And, and they transplanted, yeah. they engrafted very well, and that's because the immune system did not see them as foreign cells. They said, oh, that's our own cell. But of course, the problem with that procedure was, you know, we were still cutting out a part of, RP, uh, of the eye, and these were still old cells, they were still diseased, and so they, they were a lot of issues, and, and the surgery was very complicated. But in this case, we do uh, at least took that knowledge, and like you said, for making RP cells, it, it is literally last 30 years of work that we put together from biggest giants in developmental biology field to put together that protocol. But for, for making this transplant in what, what we call an autologous transplant as compared to an allogeneic, allogeneic would be somebody else's cells in you or in your eyes, autologous is your own cells in your eyes. Uh, the reason is, uh, like you said, the immune system would not see them as foreign cells. It would not react against them, and they will have very high chance of engrafting and immediately start helping the retina and the photoreceptors and start nourishing it so that patient can see again. Yeah, great. Um, and so I guess what, what is the advantage of using stem cell derived therapy for macular degeneration? Because we know, you know, some people have, um, you know, uh, if you have wet AMD, you have uh, the shots to try and um, reduce the, the bleeding, reduce the, the, the blood that can um, collect. And now there's, you know, 
just in the last year or so, there's there's some treatments uh, for um, dry AMD based on, you know, C3, C5 um, inflammation proteins. You know, that's the topic of another chat. So, uh, listeners, go, go to one of those. But, yeah, so what's the advantage of using the stem cell uh, therapy instead of other treatments? Yeah, good point, Diane. So both of these treatments that you mentioned for wet AMD, which has been around for many years now, and the dry AMD treatment that was that just came out this year, both of these are treatment that slow down disease progression uh, and manage the disease, and they do not really cure the cells that have been gone. They do not regenerate the cells that have already been gone. And in both cases, first of all, you have to get almost a monthly injection, sometimes bimonthly, but it's an injection in the eye. It's, it's an extremely uncomfortable thing to have, and you have to have for the rest of your life. So whereas the stem cell therapy, and like I said earlier, because RP cells and the photoreceptor cells do not have any stem cells in them, once they are dead, they are dead. The injections are not mm. going to bring the dead cells back. The injections of anti-VEGF or anti-complement inhibitors uh, are not going to bring the, the dead cells back, whereas the stem cell-derived trans transplant is going to regenerate those cells. We are bringing fresh, young, new cells in the eye with the idea that these cells will live for the next several years. So it's a one-time surgery, and hopefully the cells will stay for the rest of the life of the patient. They will not have to get a monthly injection. So that's a big advantage. So it's, it's if, it, if and when it works, it's a curative therapy as opposed to a treatment. Yeah, great. And, the, and then also, yeah, it'll help people who might have become refractory or those treatments don't work for them sometimes uh, and or the disease has progressed enough, as you said, that the cells have died. So, so this is um, this is really really amazing. Um, so, uh, at what stage do you think you know uh, what stage of it, of age related macular degeneration do you think that um, stem cell derived therapy has to be ad administered? Yeah, um, again, a good point. The stem cell derived therapy should be done. Ideally, at the time when RP cells are dying, so that we can bring RP cells in before too many photoreceptors have died. Because once the photoreceptors are dead, RP cells are not going to bring new photoreceptors. So then we have to think about double RPE photoreceptor therapy, which uh, we will maybe we'll talk later, but many of us are working on now. But this approach of RPE transplant is going to happen. At, at a stage when disease has not pro the disease has progressed to the stage that RP cells are starting to die, so you will bring in transplant the RP cells and have them protect the photoreceptors. Now, if you think about uh, late stage dry AMD, which is the geographic stage of uh, geographic atrophy stage of AMD, that lesion starts off small and it keeps growing every year, about 20, 30 percent, right? And it grows because at the edges of that lesion, RP cells continue to die. So our first mm -hmm. approach is going to be to transplant this patch in that lesion in those edges area and stop it from growing. And then as, as we get more and more comfortable that it, the technology is working, this drug is working, we, we start transplanting them earlier and earlier to the point that we don't even have much significant for receptor cell that and so that patient's vision is not significantly gone by the time we have done the transplant. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, so, yeah, it is, you know, still still in progress, right? Um, so, um, and, and you can tell us about, you know, the, the trials that are going on in a little bit, but I know that um, there's a lot of benefits and uh, hope associated with this stem cell therapy um, but, you know, we always want to look at what, what are, are there any risks associated with this? Uh, risk associated with stem cell therapy. So, you know, we, we have to think about what this drug is. Unlike a pill that we all are used to of taking or an eye drop that many of us take, you know, at the time of allergies and whatnot, uh, stem cell therapy is a living drug. These are living cells we're transplanting. These are patients on tissues we are transplanting back in their eyes, uh, and, and these cells, there's a lot that we know about them, but we don't know what we don't know, right? So we have to take that approach 
and and cautiously uh, work with this technology like any other drug that we work with and but like i said this is this drug is orders of magnitude more complex because it is a living drug we we test it in many ways in the lab we test it in animals before we transplant that in patients but it's going to react to patients on body to patients on tissues their own inflammation their own everyday lifestyle this drug will react and may behave differently so there's a lot of unknowns uh, and and as we are learning, as we are doing more and more transplants, we're learning more about this, and that that is one of the biggest thing I would say is is concerns with stem cell therapies is that there's a lot that we don't know that we don't know. Um, then of course because these are stem cells, and as when we started the call, we talked about that these stem cells can become any other cell type of the body as well, right? So we we have to make sure that we are not transplanting. And I want to make it absolutely clear to our audience is that we are not transplanting stem cells. We are transplanting stem cell-derived eye tissue that we make in a dish. And we mm. go through absolute lengths to make sure that there's not a single stem cell left in that final tissue. FDA does not allow us to go to patients until we demonstrate five different ways that there's no stem cells left in our final tissue. Because if there was one, it has a chance that it can make any other cell type of the body. But since we, we go to length to purify that, to show that that doesn't happen, uh, we're fairly confident that we're transplanting pure eye tissue in patients' eyes. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I come from the, originally I was in the cancer research field, right? And the definition of a cancer cell is uncontrolled growth, right? So I guess you want to make sure that the you know stem cells are under controlled growth, so it it uh, doesn't turn cancerous as well, right? I think that's one of the yep. risks. Yep. Oh well, when we when we and, and that's the reason when we convert the stem cells in a dish into RP cells, we ensure that there is no stem cell left, and RP cells are not once they're fully mature, they're not going to divide anymore. So those those are the reasons we have worked on this we and we when i say we the whole group or the whole field uh, who's working in this space have ensured that we're going to only transplant the final tissue not the original stem cells right so this tissue will not have potential to continue dividing this tissue will only go in to help the retina to help protect the retina to nourish the retina they, these cells will not have any proliferation potential left when when they are uh, transplanted in the eye. Great. And uh, yeah, and I think that, you know, we, d we don't want to cause like undue panic, you know, <laughs> with people. We just want people to know what are the risks and benefits. Like, you know, before you get any treatment, you want to know the benefits. And I think I was going to ask this later, but uh, I think this is probably a good time. There are, you know, a lot of um, like the process that you go through and other groups have gone through. The FDA is, you know, there's there's tight reg regulations and, you know, there's a lot of um, ethics involved. And as you said, you want to make sure that nothing is is, um, you know, is remaining as a stem cell that can that can change. But there are some, um, you know, stem cell clinics you hear of. Uh, on the news or, um, you know, some people say, ah, oh, go to Mexico or whatever and pay us X number of dollars and we'll put stem cells in your eye and get your vision back. Um, do you have anything to say about that, maybe as a public service or <laughs> uh, give us more information about that in case some of the listeners have heard of those? Uh, uh, Diane, this is, I, I think, one of the most important piece of advice we could give our audience today. When you say stem cell clinics, I will put them under quotations, you know, because these are not true, uh, uh, true, uh, true centers who are trying to develop stem cell derived therapies. These are the places who are abusing a patients' desperation to get their vision back, to transplanting something that is not even a, 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 a real cell type that should be there. The cases that I've heard about is they would take out. Uh, some fat stem cells from from the from the bo from the hip or from the fat in the body and inject it in the eye. Well, we we started this call by talking about specialized stem cells versus versus iPS cells, which behave differently. And we talked about that blood cells will only make blood stem cells will only make blood cells. Same way, fat stem cells will only make fat tissue. 
So imagine you inject fat stem cells in the eye and they end up making fat in the eye. And, and that has actually has happened. There has been cases, some patients were transplanted with such cells in, in Florida and three people actually went completely blind because of that procedure. So my word of advice is for patients to please, please be extremely cautious whenever they hear something about this, please ask them if this procedure has been approved by the FDA for a phase one, two year study. That's the first thing. And if it hasn't been approved, then it is not a real uh, experimental drug. It is somebody who's trying to make money off it. And the second thing, anybody who is doing a legitimate trial that has been clinical trial that has been cleared by the FDA and by academic agencies or academic centers, they will not charge you to participate in that study. Whereas most of these quote unquote stem cell clinics will charge you anywhere between $25,000 to $50,000 for those procedures. So please be extremely careful. NIH has on their website a lot of information about differences between legitimate trials versus uh, so-called snake oil in the stem cell field. Uh, FDA has that, uh, uh, that information on their website. Uh, International Stem Cell Society, ISSCR, has that information on their website. Please read the information. Please educate yourself. And please don't be harmed by these snake oils that are out there. Great, and you know what? I think uh, maybe what we'll do is uh, we can we can get all of those links to extra information from you after, and maybe post it at the end of the transcript when it's uh, made, just so uh, people will know where to go. Um, before we, g yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, so much, um, because you know we we just want everybody to protect themselves. Um, so before we go on to talk about more specifically about your research and your team's research, I see that um, there's one question that came in from someone that says, how do you know when the RPE cells are starting to die? And then they said, do you use OCT or another method? Um, great, great question. Yes, OCT is one of the most commonly used technologies. OCT stands for optical coherence tomography. It's a, it's a technique where they shine light uh, into the eye and they get reflectance back from the retina. And from there, it can, the technology can tell how different layers of the retina as well as the RP are structurally intact or not. Uh, there are other techniques that our uh, physician scientists and physicians use to look at if RP cells are dying. Another structural feature is called adaptive optics, where they can look at single cell resolution details of the cells and see if the cells are alive or dead. The functional measures of the vision that they can uh, use is called micropermetry, uh, dark adaptation. Mm -hmm. These are all different techniques that tell structurally and functionally if the retina and the RP are intact. And, and from those, from a very early on, they can start to tell you if RP cells are dying and will have an immediate impact actually on your vision. Great, thank you, thank you. And uh, I think we might have, you know, some information on our website. People can go and look up, um, or we could put links to uh, what all of those uh, devices are, so they could print it out and bring it to their doc. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, so uh, as I as I said before, I'm extremely proud that Bright Focus is, you know, funding you, and uh, we funded you in 2020, and also we funded, we're uh, currently funding. Uh, one of your postdocs, uh, of which you're a mentor on them. Uh, but the grant in 2020 uh, you received from Macular Degeneration Research is, um, and it has like a, you're working with something that's really cool that some people might have heard of. It's like 3D bioprinted human tissue model. So kind of like 3D printing, uh, but it's not just like spreading out ink, right, you know, or, 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 or molten plastic, you know, if you go to the library and use CAD and whatever and you create these little 3D things, this is, you, you took this one step further, so you're bringing in engineering and so you're bioprinting human tissue models to clarify the role of, you know, retinal uh, the blood vessels in the retina and um, and about you know giving more information about macular degeneration itself. This is so fascinating. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about this research? D Diane, first of all, I have to say you summarize it really well. Thank you very much. So essentially, <laughs> you're absolutely absolutely right. We're bringing engineering and biology together 
And the idea comes from uh, what we talked earlier in the call is that there are two types, two advanced stages of AMD. One is the dry AMD that we are trying to treat with this RP transplants, in which case we talked about the RP cells die, but we also talked about that RP cells are nourishing the photoreceptors and the retina. They're bringing nutrients from the blood supply that is present underneath the RPE and taking it back to the photo, taking the photoreceptors and they take all the metabolites from the photoreceptors, they take it back to the blood supply. That's the one important function RP cells perform. And, and in dry AMD, as RP cells die, the blood supply also underneath the blood supply starts to die. And that whole relationship between uh, RP cells function, nourishing the retina, how they take this nutrients from the blood supply, bring it to the retina, and why the blood supply dies when RP cells die is not clear. And then the same, uh, kind of the opposite thing happens in the other advanced form of AMD called the wet AMD, where the blood supply grows too much. And then what I like to call is grows in the wrong direction or the Z direction, and it penetrates through the RPE, ruptures the RPE barriers, and leaks fluid into the retina and blood into the retina, and then of course leads to blindness. So again, there it's not clear why in the case of wet AMD, these capillaries divide too much, they proliferate too much, whereas in dry AMD, they tie. So we thought we, we need to recreate this tissue in a dish so we can better understand the kind of the, the close interaction, the kind of the symbiotic interaction that we think is there between the RPE and the blood supply. So to, to achieve that, we combine the stem cell biology, the developmental biology that we have been talking about, that from iPS cells, we can not only make the RPE cells, we can make cells of blood vessels, the endothelial cells, the, the pericytes, the fibroblasts, that all, and then what we do is uh, by combining that whole thing with 3D bioprinting, which essentially is, is, a, is a little bit fascinating instrument that has two uh, syringes attached on in, in it, which we can control in a very precise X, Y, Z orientation. And in those syringes, we fill in cells mixed with hydrogels. And in this case, the cells that would make the capillaries, that would be the endothelial cells, pericytes and fibroblasts. And, when, and then we go around in our dish and we make the capillary network artificially with that structure, with that syringe, by moving it in a very precise way. And the cells, because they are coming from stem cells, they have that natural tendency, they know what to do. They, they, they start doing their job within literally one week that the endothelial cells start to make vessels and capillaries and pericytes wrap themselves around and start supporting the lumen of them and fibroblasts fill in the matrix in between, make the matrix so that the capillaries can stay stable. And, and then we, on the other side, we put a scaffold in between. On, on the other side, we see the RPE cells, again, made from IPS cells. And in about five weeks or so, the whole tissue matures. And it was, we were fascinated to see that we, we make genetic tissue, but when they start talking, the RP cells and the capillaries start talking to each other, they start behaving like, um, uh, like they would in the eye. They, they have same gene expression pattern, they have the same functionality. And then we tried to do what was the most difficult part. We tried to replicate the dry AMD phenotype and the wet AMD phenotype by different type of stressors in that dish. So I told you that in dry AMD, when RP cells are not happy, capillaries die. We did the same experiment in a dish. We made RP cells unhappy, and we saw that the capillaries died. And then we did the opposite experiments where we caused hypoxia in RP cells, which is known to secrete this chemical called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is known to cause wet AMD. And guess what? The capillaries made wet AMD in a dish which we, would, we could suppress by adding anti-VEGF antibodies. So this gave us a lot of confidence that the tissue that we have recreated in a dish has a lot of clinical potential, has a lot of translational potential. It can not only be used to better study how disease progresses, how it initiates, it can be used to discover new drugs that will slow down disease progression, that will slow down cell death, that will slow down capillary cell death. And, and I have to say, th thank a lot of thanks to Bright Focus Foundation who funded a lot of this work early on. Very early on, you guys saw the potential of this work before we had published it and before we had completed it. 
and that led us to really complete a lot of this uh, uh, man, uh, the work in, that went through one of the manuscripts where we were trying to understand how these two tissues work together and now we're taking it to the next step where we will be uh, making um, uh, patient specific tissues with different types of risk alleles and trying to understand how AMD progression happens in this patient. So, so that, that was one of the work uh, that you funded, as you said, in 2020. And, but uh, Bright Focus has also thankfully funded one of the fellow in my group, who, by the way, uh, we just nominated him for the NEI Director's Rising Star Award, and he got that award. And he is, he is indeed our rising star. What he has done is he has combined artificial intelligence with image analysis to really better understand the different types of RP cells that are present in human eye and discovered that there are five different subpopulations of RP cells that are present in different areas of the eye and they have slightly different function. And in fact, uh, if you look at diseases like macular degeneration versus another monogenic disease called chorodremia, different populations die. So now this gives us a handle how to look at the role of how to study specifically macular degeneration in one specific subpopulation versus chorodemia in a different subpopulation. And what David is doing, uh, again, thanks to funding from Bright Focus Foundation, is looking at why the cells in the macula, why the RP cells in the macula in, in a patient's eye die and not far away from it. So that means he has an internal control. And since he can recreate both the central cells and the peripheral cells in a dish from IPS cells, He's able to compare the difference between them. He's able to compare the differential disease sensitivity to better understand why disease only happens in the center, not in the periphery. And then I think that will be a very important piece for us to um, perhaps even prevent disease from happening as opposed to treating it when it's further gone and we have to bring the whole tissue made from stem cells. And Davide's approach will hopefully help us uh, uh, do uh, bring bring new uh, drugs for disease prevention as well. So that's those are the two studies that I wanted to highlight, both for, uh, funded by the Bright Focus Foundation. So thank you very much. Oh, oh my gosh. It, we're just so, and, and thank you to all the donors out there um, who are probably listening right now. Thank you to, you know, donating to us to help support this. And I think, uh, and, and just, you know, to clarify, that's Dr. David Ortolan. Um, we have info on the website, and um, your one mentor and Dr. Ruchi Sharma and is, is another mentor too, so uh, you can look that up. Um, but yeah, no, you really underline the importance, and that's why uh, of funding basic research, um, because you know we still don't even know, you know, a lot of the basic reasons why this disease starts, and um, you know, the stem cell treatment uh, is is amazing, and we'll talk a little bit more in just a second uh, about, you know, you are part of a big team that's moving that forward. But like what you said, I mean, it's, it's prevention is so much better <laughs> if we can try and uh, figure out how to prevent the disease from even happening, then um, that, that would be, that would be amazing. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're just, we're just so honored to be able to fund your research. Um, so in the summer of uh, 2022, last summer, you were part of a team that surgically implanted replacement tissues from patient-derived IPS cells. Uh, it's kind of like a IPS cell-derived RPE patch, this patch that you were talking about, to treat advanced dry AMD, this um, geographic atrophy that you're talking about. Can you tell us a little bit more about that procedure and what was done? Um, and, you know, of course, what you can publicly tell us about, because, of course, if the clinical trial isn't done yet, you can't tell us any of that. Yes, Diane, uh, thank you for asking that question. So this is really kind of culmination of almost 10 years of our work trying to develop this treatment made from patients on stem cells, patients on iPS cells, as, as we've talked in the last half an hour. What we did was we create the RPE monolayer in a dish on a scaffold that is biodegradable and degrades within a few weeks. And so some of it is outside, some of it is in the in, in the eye, and then and degradation products 
are not harmful to the eye. So we were able to make a small piece about eight square millimeter, which covers a good part of the macula. And the procedure is obviously, as, as we have talked in, in the last few minutes, is that this kind of procedure will be applicable only to very late stage patients where RP cells are dead and we want to protect the photoreceptors by transplanting uh, new RP cells. So those were the patients chosen for this procedure. And essentially, uh, it's a surgical procedure where we go from the side of the eye and make an incision in the retina and transplant the tissue under the retina, uh, the RP tissue under the retina. That's when RP cells are naturally present anyways. And in the area where the RP cells are gone because of the disease, the RP cells have already died. And that procedure was done in the first patient uh, last year. This was the first patient in the United States where such a procedure was done. I should say that a similar procedure has been done in, in Japan many years ago once. And that patient, uh, was his, his eyes been stable and did not need, that patient in Japan was a wet AMD patient. And what I hear is that patient did not need any more in, injections of anti-VEGF therapy. Similar, different approaches, slightly different approaches are underway using allogeneic uh, RPE patch. So as we talked earlier, allogeneic means it's somebody else's cells. So these are primarily RP cells made from embryonic stem cells. Uh, and But a similar patch, in their case, put on a piece of plastic uh, sheet is made on a plastic membrane. And uh, a trial has been underway in California and a similar trial has been underway in London. So many groups are moving forward. We're all learning from each other, and we are all, the, the goal is really to bring this, this technology, bring this drug more as a common practice to everyone. We're all at early stages. We're all, as we have talked earlier, uh, walking this line cautiously to make sure that we are being keeping uh, patients safe and, and away from harm. But the hope is that one day, we will make this available, most widely available to as many patients as possible. The trial at NEI is still ongoing. It was unfortunate that a trial started in the middle of the pandemic or start of the pandemic, and we, we couldn't transplant anyone because of the pandemic. We all know that we had to shut down several clinical operations. But right now, the trial has picked back again, and we are hoping to transplant more patients in the coming several months. And we will keep you posted as we go along with this journey. What's the what's the projected time frame to you know have everyone you know enrolled and treated and and kind of have the results to the readout to publish? Um, good point. So for a phase one to a study, typically it's anywhere between three to five years that the study lasts. Uh, for us, it it uh, went a little longer because of the pandemic, as I said. But we, we hope that in the next few years, we will wrap up this study. We realized that our enrollment had been slower because of uh, all these reasons that we talked. So we are trying to now open two additional clinical sites, which will be uh, announced early next year. That will help us do uh, this procedure or this trial, run this trial at three different sites that will speed up the, the enrollment. And we hope to complete our enrollment in the next couple of years and that's when we hope to announce the results. Usually, the way these trials are, or any trial is done, any drug development requires different stages. Phase 1, 2A, 2A is usually safety and feasibility stage. That's where we are. And then we will move on to what is called the Phase 2B, where we will have first signs of efficacy. And because the stem cell-derived drugs are so complex, so complicated, and take so long, FDA allows them uh, to get to uh, a faster track of approval. So that means if the phase 2B result, where we might be transplanting between around 60 to 80 patients, uh, if those results look promising, if we see signs of efficacy, then already in phase three, it can be a registration trial. That means uh, patients can uh, register, they can be reimbursement from the Medicare, uh, uh, for for this kind of work, and it can be most widely available as well. But you know, you're looking at all of this combined. You're looking at uh, anywhere between five to eight year timeline until this is widely available. Okay, so your trial is still going on. There's other trials going on. So, uh, and of course, you know, to be able to um, enroll in a trial, you have to meet the. Uh, 
uh, enrollment criteria and and yet not have any of the exclusion criteria and each trial is different so uh, just in case there's some people listening who might want to you know consider joining your trial or other trials um, are, are there you know other active clinical trials and, and where can they um, find out about them and yet avoid those uh, nasty uh, in quotation, stem cell clinics that aren't FDA approved. How can how can uh, people find a legitimate uh, trial to enroll in, and what are they out there for AMD right now? Yes, yeah, so Diane, there are many trials for AMD that are ongoing, and all of those are listed at clinicaltrials.gov. I repeat, clinicaltrials.gov, where all of this is this information is available. You go in in the simple search tabs. If you look for any I, IPS, RPE trial, you will find that information. Similarly, you will find other trials. I have to warn, though, that the, the quote-unquote stem cell clinics also have the information on clinicaltrials.gov, but you will see that on the second page, there has to be a clear disclaimer, for instance, for our trial, that it has been cleared by the FDA for a phase one, two year study, and those clinics cannot put such a disclaimer because they haven't gone through the FDA yet. So please look out for that disclaimer ask the right questions to the study coordinators so that you are uh, enrolling in a legitimate trials. And as you said, Diane, the early stage trials have much harder, stricter uh, eligibility criteria, but as we get more and more comfortable with the safety of the drug, we the, the criteria get more and more relaxed and larger number of patients can participate in those trials. Great. Yeah. No, that's a really great. So to look on that second page to see if they were approved by FDA, there's sometimes a code or something. And then also they could probably just print that page out and, and bring it to um, healthcare provider too to ask them about it. And I guess on that page too, there's normally like a telephone number that people can call to get more information, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, any, anything else about um, the stem cell um, clinical trials before I go on? I mean, this has been just so fascinating. Um, I, I do want to put out a word of caution that sometimes when people hear the word stem cell, they think, you know, there's a magic bullet here and, you know, it will cure and treat everything. I, I agree that stem cell-derived therapies do have curative potential. But just like any drug, it's a lot of work in progress, and there's a lot of iterative uh, work on our side to make sure that it is done correctly. And and often, you know, we are going back from patients and changing some things and coming back to patients. So it will be, it may take time, and especially in early stage patients, I don't think we may see big signs of efficacy. We will have to wait until these drugs are perfected until they reach the right stage of patients to sign to really see their potential, their true potential of, of curative treatment. But uh, I'm hopeful, and yet I want to be cautious at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely. So, oh my gosh, so this has been so wonderful. We've been talking for 50 minutes already. <laughs> so I've probably talked for another 50, and I'm sure we'll do it when I meet you at Arvo next year. But um, uh, and, you know, maybe we can invite you back in the future, you know, when you have more that you need to, that you'll be reporting on your trial. That would be awesome if, if you're open to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So thank you for the info you shared today. Um, to, your, uh, to our listeners, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. So, uh, Dr. Barty, before we conclude, are there any final remarks that you'd like to share with the audience? Um. Final remarks. I do. I do want to say that I think I, I want to send a hopeful message that these are exciting times in stem cell-based therapies. Uh, Field has been working on it for a long time, and we're really at a turning point that we have not only, as I mentioned, for RPE, many trials ongoing. We have many trials in preparation for photoreceptor cell therapy, which my group and many other groups are working on. We're working on a dual RPE for receptor therapy for really late stage patients. And at the same time, we and many other companies are working on trying to democratize this access to these potentially expensive therapies by automation. Uh, like you said earlier, Diane, we can combine engineering and AI. 
We're using all of those expertise, combining AI and engineering and microfluidics to really automate the manufacturing process and hopefully bring this technology to much wider uh, group of patients and at a much reasonable price. So there's a lot happening. Uh, please be on the lookout and we hope that we will bring uh, more and more uh, upcoming and, and cutting edge drugs and therapies to patients. I think that's a good way to end on a hopeful, empowering note. So thank you so much for being My with pleasure. us today. Thank you for this having concludes, me. Guys. Oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, now this concludes our Bright Focus Macular Chat. The information provided in this recording is a public service of Bright Focus Foundation and is not intended to constitute medical advice. Please consult your physician for personalized medical, dietary, and or exercise advice. Any medications or supplements should only be taken under medical supervision. Bright Focus Foundation does not endorse any medical products or therapies.